Sunday Talks with the Marshmallow Man. Hey, I'm Ozzy from Three Monkey Solderless, home of the world's best cables for your pedal board. So we got DC, we got audio, need to check us out, threemonkeysolderless.com at the link below. All right, so it's been a minute, and uh, I've been, I was on the, I was away, I was on the road. I was up in New York, my, my former home, uh, dealing with some stuff up there uh, for a month, so I didn't really have internet connection, and it was really working hard on some things up there. So uh, didn't really have a chance to check in and then uh, came back last week and jumped right back into it with a generous invitation from Mark and Dave over at Tone Talk. So uh, we did that on Friday night, went on for two and a half hours or so. I had a blast. I wanted to thank them again for their hospitality and uh, I really enjoyed it. So uh um, I hope, you know, I want to thank everybody that was on the channel for listening and for the guys that kind of like ask questions. Um, and there was, you know, a lot of, a lot of talk in the, in this like side, it's kind of like chat. I couldn't see it, but, uh, there was a lot of like interesting activity going on in there as well. So, you know, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. So to get back on, you know, back on the chase and doing things, um, there's some stuff to start on maybe to, to get going with. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe, maybe we could just like start off with like a quick, like thing that kind of like was brought to my attention before I left to New York and then wasn't really able to do anything with it. Um, but I think it's, it's really interesting for some people. It may be like old news and it's like, Oh yeah, I know about that for me. It wasn't. And I was keyed into it by a friend, Mike. So thanks Mike. Uh, about this particular piece of equipment that I think he was keyed into by Mark Slaughter, who uh, said he, you know, when he was recording that this thing was something that was always used and it was used in a way that wasn't really sort of like the way the manufacturer designed it to, but engineers had figured out was, you know, kind of like a really cool effect. And that is, well, let's, oh, I got to go into a screen recording to do that. So maybe... Maybe not right away. All right, but it's basically called, you know, the Type A um, Dolby Noise Reduction Unit, okay? So what what this thing is, and let me, let me move some things out of the way here so I can see what I'm doing. Oh, yeah. Okay, so what the Dolby thing was, is it was a noise reduction unit that was used for studios in the 70s to go to tape with a better signal to noise ratio. All right, and what they found out was, and there's a lot of videos on YouTube about this unit, right? It's like this white unit um, with these colored square push buttons, looks very R2-D2, it's very cool. But what they, what producers found out with is that if you only use, let's say the one side, the, the uh, you know, there's a, I think it's a compander, right? Compressor expander. If you use like the, just one side of it, it adds like this incredible brightness in air really high frequency sort of stuff to this original signal and it could make things sound really alive and really give space around them and sound bright and sound pleasing right it was a very pleasing bright sound so the uh uh that was keyed into me so also that there was a plug-in company that made a plug-in that you could use which was to you know sort of like simulate the dbx unit and i got that one and it's called the the audio thing type a all right so the audio thing type a and immediately upon like kind of like plugging it in um and uh you know using it i found that you know it was uh it was it was really something it really was so maybe we could just like quickly jump into that and you know just like into GarageBand for like a quick second i'll just show you what the plugin looks like and kind of like the differences between when it's in and out of the loop with the marshmallow and the guitar. So let's go into GarageBand and, and we'll check it out there. And right now, and this is just a project um, that I had created, you know, before I had left, which is, you know, I haven't really done too much with it. It's just like this sort of like amp demo thing that I use, just like a really basic sound for the guitar. So, you know, it's once again, slightly different than all the other setups that I've used for this um for this sort of like chase. So let's just listen to what we got, right? So I'm on, I got the mic here and I got two signals coming from 
you know, the ox stomp and the marshmallow. So this is sort of like the bass sound. I got a little reverb on here on platinum verb and it's, you know, in stereo here. So let's just listen to the bass sound and uh, we'll listen to that. Here we go. Let me mute the mic here. So that way we can hear the guitar. <laughs> Okay, so that's without the type A. So let's bring in the type A and it's right here. All right, and this is what it looks like, right? The plugin. So you have these R2D2 type, you know, little multicolored square push buttons um, and in and out, right? For bringing, the, bringing the, uh, the effect in and out of the chain. You have a little compressor here, which is kind of cool too. Um, and then you have these four bands and they are, sort of like, you know, different frequencies that you can accentuate. And they're sort of, they, they're a little in interactive to my ear, which is cool. So I kind of just like, you know, quickly futzed around with the, with the settings and uh, sort of, you know, came up with a, with a quick setting that would allow us to really hear, you know, kind of what this thing, um, you know, sounds like. So let's just listen to, you know, where I've got it. It may be a little too much, but I think, you know, it's a good thing to have a little bit much of the effect so you really know what it sounds like. So let's mute the mic again and we can go and uh, listen to this. That thing is pretty cool, isn't it? Um, I'm just using like my headphones to listen to this kind of stuff. So, you know, it may be obnoxiously bright, but I think it, it just sounds good. Um, you know, it really kind of starts to add, you know, some things that I really love in, you know, those mixes, right, of the first album. So I just thought I'd key into this, this audio thing, type A plugin which is available from Audio Thing Limited. And uh, maybe it's something you want to mess around with too. All right, so let's get back into the room and we'll uh, continue the discussions. All right, so I thought that that sounded, you know, pretty cool. I really think it, you know, it, it definitely... So yeah, I think that thing really sounds cool. So I think we're going to be messing around with that a little bit more. And also on the signal chain, right? So what what have I got like the the aux set up as? So here here's like the pedal, right? Eh, I don't want it to fall over. Give me some lead. It does not want to give me much lead. Okay, there we go. There we go. All right, so chain obviously is just the guitar with the custom custom into the marshmallow. One channel you know, everything on gag, except for, you know, the, the normal channel, which I've got up at about 10 o'clock, just to unload that first, you know, stage a little bit where they sort of combine together at the mixers. And then the stomp, it's sort of like set on what I really think I like now, which is, 
it's the greenback punch and direct sound, right? So it has some direct and it has some greenback. It's probably like 85-15 in favor of greenback. Just enough direct. You kind of just like feather it in. My ears change a little bit, but I still think that direct sound to me is something that um, it's working for me, right? It's working for me. So I am not saying that, there's, that this is absolutely the way that you have to do it or the way that it was done. I don't know. I'm using my own, like I always say, I'm using my own experiences and my own knowledge and trying to figure out a way to get to the finish line with what I, with what I know over, you know, however many decades I've been kind of, you know, messing around with electronics. So um, that's sort of the signal chain. Then we just go straight into this, you know, cheapy focus, right? Uh, interface and then into garage band. I put a little bit of, you know, Apple's reverb on it, you know, to make up for the clams. So that's it really. So, you know, we're going to continue, I think, dialing this stuff in. I mean, I was kind of getting off on the fair warning thing, which I still want to do, but I got to send out my other eventide, the 910, to um, get get worked on. And then when it comes back, I want to dive more into, you know, the fair warning thing. So, yeah, I think that's where we're going to begin. And in terms of like marshmallow, like construction, like when will more marshmallows be available? I'm thinking it's going to be like, you know, the end of summer. I'm I'm trying to do the best I can, but it's like, you know, it's not a, this is not what I would call a full-time amp manufacturing facility or business or whatever. I just love building things and I love building things myself. And I really get a lot of satisfaction and enjoyment and peace of mind from when I'm actually working, building things. It's very Zen. It keeps, you know, it, it calms my mind. It's almost like meditation when I'm building something. And it, when I'm done, I feel very calm having, you know, really concentrated on how this piece of equipment is to be built. And then you have the satisfaction of having the thing, right? Which is great. And then you get even more satisfaction when you give it to somebody and they get some fun out of it. So it's, you know, that's what it's about for me, right? I don't want to, you know, go much too much further than that. It's just, you know, that's, that's what I like to do. And, you know, so I'm going to try to do as much as I can. So be patient with me. Be patient with me. All right. So um, I also thought it might be fun to look at some of the some of the comments, I think, in the sec in, in that from the tone talk that maybe I didn't address. Um, uh, you know, it's kind of like when you're in the moment, you know, there's a there's a lot of like, you know, you just met you were just meeting people, you know, like Dave and Mark. And it's kind of like, you know, at the same time, you're trying to, you know, exp talk about the subject at hand you're also involving yourself in sort of like that natural social sort of like, um, you know, protocol in a sense where you're getting to know people, right? So it's not always going to be, you know, direct down to the topic. I think that's, you know, that may be, maybe we should do it again, right? But I'll try to address some of these, um, some of these questions um, and some of these things that I thought were interesting in the, in, in the, during the course of the, uh, of the episode. Um, all right. So I, there was something there from twisted Rickster. That was an awesome show. Part two should have Ozzy talk about the marshmallow internals rock on. Yeah. So twisted um, internals. I mean, if you were to open this thing up, basically, you know, there is a line out on it. So that's, you know, different. Uh, but if you were to like, look at the circuit, it's a plexi, like a 68 sort of like plexi somewhere in that range. And you would notice a load resistor in there and that's it, right? But the, there's, you know, I think it's more in the line of why it sounds this way is due to how the power transformer is obviously simulating the variac, right? So the heater voltages, the high voltages are all being lowered as it would be if the um, amplifier was running off of a hundred and rather an 85 volt uh, input source into the uh, 120 volt primary. And I did it in such a way where it's just not, you know, it was, it was an interesting way. There, there are a few ways that you could accomplish that task. One would be just be like, give me a wind this way. I did it in a way that I thought was unique. I, I won't talk too much about it. I mean, I got to keep some things to myself, right? I don't want to give away everything right away. I, that's just, you know, it's fun. 
So um, other than that, you know, the power, the Apple transformer is the next thing, right? Like how is it loading the power tubes and how is it simulating, you know, what may have been, you know, I think we talked about this in, 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 um, in tone talk, right? It was like, what are the different ways and, uh, that, that amplifier could have been malfunctioning or you see malfunctioning isn't exactly the right word. It could be, but it could be just being used improperly or a variety of ways. So my theory was, well, maybe the output transformer had a problem with it, right? But he was known to have blown these up a lot as well. So if an output transformer, let's say, has a short somewhere in the secondary, um, and let's say it's not, it's in a place across the secondary, right? So the primary is what goes to the power tubes, right? And has the high voltage on it. The secondary is what is sort of magnetically inductively combined with the primary to drive an AC signal out the back of the amplifier, right? It's those winds that are on the second, secondary second, second part of the output transformer. And they have the four ohm lead, eight ohm lead, 16 ohm lead, common lead, right? Which is grounded and they go to the jacks. Now, if that coil were somewhere inside the secondary shorted somewhere in there that allowed it to still produce some sort of load that wasn't dead zero, um, it would reflect back to the primary a different load characteristic for those power tubes, which would then cause them to distort in a different way. So my, that was one possible theory of how it works, right? It could also be that the amplifier was connected to a load that was somewhere in a range that would cause the amplifier to, to distort in that way too. So in any given problem, right, there's usually multiple solutions or explanations for something happening. And in physics, they will come down usually to the same thing. Right. So it's like it's two ways of getting the same physical sort of like phenomenon, but the phenomenon is the same. Right. So it'd be like two different ways of getting to the same physical phenomenon. So those were the ways that I theorized could have done that could have produced that sound that the amplifier, the way I hear or I heard that amplifier sound on those eruption overheads from those sunset sound episodes where it sounded, you know, incredibly splatty distorted. Right. So that was, that was the, that was the whole, you know, sort of like, um, reason detra for any of this was hearing that and going, Oh my God, that's what it was. Because when Don, um, got through with, you know, really kind of doing his magic to the sounds, right? To mix that album, to record that album and to make it sound the way it did, you know, that kind of sound was changed a little bit and made a little bit more fun sounding or a little bit more smooth sounding or acceptable sounding, right? So, you know, that's that's sort of like the whole uh more the the internal sort of thing, right? So rock on too, twisted, appreciate it. Um this is Mark Pritchard. Hey, Mark. Uh, great show, guys. Been watching Ozzy for a few... Thanks, Mark. For a few years now. Love his Van Halen rabbit holes. Yeah, there's a lot of them. But you know what? I think Eddie dug most of them, and I just run down them and see where they go. Or maybe not. I don't know. I shouldn't say that. And Mark's tattoo looks sick. So he just sent me um, yesterday. It's finished, right? So I'm sure he's going to want to show it off. And he has he showed me a video of the whole thing. And Eddie looks really good. I mean, it's, it's like the perfect like photo, right? If I was going to get uh, a tattoo and like I said, I'm a little bit too much of a scaredy cat for anything like that. Right. Um, I would, uh, that would be it. Right. Like I'd almost want like a, you know, that artist to have done like an airbrushed poster of that photograph but the looking the way it does on Mark's arm, I would love to get something like that because I think it's, it just looks really cool, you know? And when you see someone, you know, when someone interprets another person and draws them, you know, that's, 
getting a look into the artist's mind of how they see the person, right? And how they draw their features and everything. And what strikes them about the subject that they then bring into their artwork reveals a lot about how they feel about that subject, right? And what was revealed in that artwork made me think that the tattoo artist uh, really was uh, fond of it. So that was cool. That was definitely cool. I don't know if that's the case, you know, maybe, maybe not. All right. So, um, uh, Troy, hey, Troy, uh, the Jose pedal is awesome. Thanks, Troy. I'm glad you're enjoying that thing. Uh, it was fun to build it for you. Uh, let's see, Days Under Grass. I was lucky enough to, I don't even know if this is legal. Am I allowed to comment on, on this? If I'm not Mark and Dave, I'm sorry. Uh, but I figured it'd be fun. I didn't want to go into your, um, you know, into your comment section and like, you know, hijack the thing. So I'll just do it here. Uh, Mar uh, Days Undergrass says, I was lucky enough to come across a Three Monkeys orangutan combo in surf green. I think I remember that. <laughs> I definitely remember that. In fact, I want to say maybe it was from, for that you got it in Virginia, maybe. I don't know. So I picked up the combo. I uh, take it, open up and dang, work of art. They have crushed gold glass between clear plexi face plates that needs to be seen. Gloss red chassis, handmade custom transformers. Ha wow, this is a long one. Hand wire, just stunning. So simple, reverb knob. Tube and awesome, by the way, never washes out. Volume, bass, treble, pull on the bass, cuts out the EQ section. Yeah, uh, foot switchable, by the way, gives more volume and boosting. Gain a bit. Lastly, a voice knob, the six position switch that hits everything but <laughs> true metal. True, we were not um, building, you know, like a metal amp. It was, you know, this was like a classic rock amp. Uh, Fender Voxy Plex, even I'm almost tweed, moves orangey. You nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. Fender Vox Plexi Tweed and Orange, absolutely. But the lo but lower the bass, raise the treble, raise the treble over the bass. It's also usable, warm, and just about perfect. It's not metal or rock amp. It's not a metal or rock amp, which is my go-to, but it's the best amp I've ever owned. You could open it up and charge guitar nerds to look inside, and it's 30 to 35 watts, uses four 6v6s, which I have it in, or two 34s, correct, or six L6s, correct. Uh, which Greg also replied almost instantly, well, what do you buy a 6v6 tongue soles to? And is it loud, loud, loud? It's kind of loud. Even more, I built a head shell matching trapezoid specs. Oh, wow. I'd like to see that. Um, but need a logo badge, even though they're no longer available. They sent me a badge. Yep. And a handwritten note from Greg. So I have the coolest looking, best sounding head in 112 that could hope for you. Even better than... Half could deny it's the nicest piece of art in the house and makes a beautiful noise. Can I tell you enough? Um, well, that was that was pretty cool. Days under, yeah. So the the orangutan was the first amp, right? That three monkeys came up with, right? So, um, you know, when uh, myself, you know, Greg and Brad uh, sort of got together to build this sort of to build an amp we you know we sat around and we were just basically it was really weird i think i talked about this a little bit in the in the videos right with with in this video that we had gone so far as to create like a fake history of a company that never existed three monkeys and that these were the amplifiers that were made like in the late 50s and 60s and that these were like you know these were them right the orangutan was that amp so we went through like fashion. I mean, we really, you know, developed this whole morgue of ideas around this amplifier before we even like started with it. And then it became, all right, so what tubes do we want to use? And so that was the first question. So once the tube complement was sort of like worked out, which would be six V6s and the power requirement, which would be around 30 watts, we knew, all right, we got four six V6s. So that led to a chassis. Right. So I, I'm thinking to myself, I draw it out. I'm looking at, you know, wh how this thing is going to be laid out. And I know, you know, Marshall stuff really well. Right. So I'm like, OK, so the grounding plane on a Marshall and the chassis on a Marshall, I'm very familiar with. So I could take some of those ideas and transport them into the orangutan. And then I have sort of like a head start on 
knowing that this is going to have a good chance of working right, right? Because when you're when you're designing something from the ground up like this, that is a you know a tube amplifier. A tube amplifier is like that far away from being either a radio transmitter or a receiver, right? It's both in a box. So when you try to build this thing, you have all kinds of components. Some are listening and they're listening for everything, all the RF around in the, in the box, and some are just transmitting, right? And sometimes you don't want them to talk. <laughs> and sometimes you do want them to talk, but maybe you don't want them to say everything. You just want them to talk a little bit, right? And sometimes you want them to be completely separate. So, you know, starting from somewhere where you have an idea of where it's going is not a bad idea. So we had the chassis. We had the, you know, the tube complement. Then it came to, you know, working out the transformers. So we, you know, came up with some ideas for a transformer design, um, a choke, a power, and an output. Um, we had Haybower make us up a bunch of prototypes, and we got them in. So then came positioning all the transformers into the chassis, right, to get them into the right places. And you'll notice, yeah, yeah. so if you notice on the orangutan, um, let me grab something here. Right, so, all right, so let's say this is the power transformer, right, like this, okay, let me, yeah, there we go. And this is the output transformer, right, like so. This would be like how it's sort of like in a Marshall amplifier, right, so you would notice that they're kind of like perpendicular and parallel, right, in a sense. So what's interesting is if you, if you were to turn on that power transformer, it throws off a magnetic field around it, right? Now, this, tra this transformer, the output transformer, is going to sit inside that magnetic field to some extent, depending upon where it is, right? So, what, you know, the easiest thing to do, which I did, was you just turn on the, mount the transformer, the power transformer on the chassis, so that you've got it in the position, and that is just like the keystone, right? That's the keystone of the amplifier build. And then take the power, the output transformer and stick it on top of the chassis and then plug the secondary into an oscilloscope and then start moving the transformer around and watching the scope. And you'll see as it starts to get into the, the field of the, of the power transformer, you can see it come up on the scope. So the quietest position happened to be turning it like this, right? Moving it out and turning it like this. And then I got it into a spot where they were no longer coupled. Right. So that's it's just kind of interesting. That's all. Not like it was like, oh, this is, but it's just I thought it'd be interesting because a lot of people were like or a couple of people who bought the amp originally would be like, whoever built this thing wasn't paying attention because the output transformer is crooked in there. <laughs> and I'm like, you have no idea <laughs> what was going on with that. All right. So then you do the same thing with the choke. And that was more like a forward back sort of thing. And then you start putting in components and moving the board, sorry, moving the board around relative to the tube sockets. And then you start worrying about, you know, so it is an involved process when you're building an amplifier. You're really coming from multiple angles, trying to zero in on this, chipping away here, chipping away here, moving in towards the center to complete it, you know? All right, we got all the transformers in the right places. Now let's move the board around. If we move the board over here, we got to move this tube over here. But then this, tr then the input jacks got to go a little bit more this way, a little bit more this way. Let's let's change where the pots are so we can move the jack a little bit over this way. So we have a line, straight line going down this way with a shielded cable going to the socket as opposed to cutting across, you know. And where the power tubes are going to be, all that kind of stuff is huge when you're building an amp, and you want it all to work together right, right? And that definitely is the case because you can build amplifiers that just are duds. I mean, they work, right? They make noise, you know, they're not horrible or whatever, but they don't have like that synergy, right? Where they're just, there's something, something special. There's like more that you're getting out of this than out of that. Even though the circuits are identical, right? You could take two, you could take a circuit, identical parts and put it together in different sort of like relationship, component to component and they're going to sound different. It's not dramatic, like a Marshall isn't going to start sounding like a Fender, but you'll notice, hey man, this amp just won't give up. You hold a note, it holds it for you. This amp sputters. You know, it, it kind of dies a little bit. You got to be a little bit louder, 
you know so the orangutan it just you know we worked on it for i don't even know <laughs> it was months and months and months and then we dragged the prototypes out because we were here in raleigh i'd moved down for the project from new york and then we went out to walnut creek which was like the local shed right where all the bands play when they come through town and greg you know he's obviously been in the business a long time has a lot of friends that are on the road. So when he knew a person that was coming around, we'd bring out an amplifier to sound check to get some guys' ideas of like how it's sounding. Players, sound guys, techs, all that kind of stuff, right? So, I mean, there were like anyone from like the guys from the Counting Crows to Rick Nielsen, all these different people, sound guys, um, you know, listening to this thing and telling us what we thought. And then we'd come back and we try to improve it more. And then we'd bring it over to Brad's house and have him play it. And, you know, we ended up with something that I really loved. I thought it was really cool. And then, you know, it started to branch out from there into the Grease Monkey, which was like the hot rotted Vox amplifier, right? And the Sock Monkey, which was like the little sort of like Grease Monkey. So to me, those are really the core of Three Monkeys. Those, those three amplifiers are where like, um, isn't that weird? Three monkeys, three amplifiers. Why didn't we think of that? <laughs> All right. Orangutan, sock monkey, grease monkey. That's that's like three monkeys to me, right? Now, we built all kinds of stuff for all kinds of people, too, during those years. I mean, Jose's, we built, uh, you know, total custom prototypes, weird things, you know, for people. And they worked out great. So that was that was so much fun. And, you know, maybe one day... We'll, we'll, we'll start doing stuff like that again. I just needed a break, you know? Um, it's sort of like we were, I think we were trying to grow it beyond where it was fun, right? So at some point, you no longer are doing what you love. And now you're watching other people do what you love and trying to manage them. And, that, and I am not a manager, right? I'm not a manager. That's not my skill. I am not. I'm, you know, I'm way too tolerant of everything, <laughs> right? So if somebody was like, you know, hey, you know, I, I'm kind of like, you know, I'm working on this thing over here in this way. I'd be like, man, that's cool. I really like the way you're doing that. Keep working on it until you perfect it. Instead of like, what the hell are you doing? Hurry up. You know, I can't, I can't do that. So the monkey thing was like, all right, I think we've gone as far as we could go in terms of just like, you know, having me do production and things like that. So you know, it had to slow down. So maybe we'll reinvent ourselves as something that's a little bit smarter to who we are and not try to be something that we're not wanting to be, right? So who knows what's in the future for Three Monkeys? It's not gone, I'll tell you that. So, all right, that was cool. I enjoyed that um, that that uh, primer, uh, Days Under Grass. Um, let's see. Uh, I had a technical, I had technical issues yesterday. Was I able to pull up the comments and donate? I had some questions. I want to thank Ozzy for sharing his knowledge. This is uh, Rosa Amplification. What's up? Yeah, I've, 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 I think we've talked. I built up an exact clone of Brad Whitford's amp. Uh, I don't know which amp that would be, as well as Jose's load box, but modified so it's switchable between 4, 8, and 16, and 24. Sure, it's a little more versatile. Both works great. I'm I'm, oh, I know. The Jose's not Brad's. That I could say, <laughs> right? It wasn't Brad's. I, I, you know, the Jose amp actually, um, I acquired it before, um, you know, I was in there with Brad, before, you know, I started working with him. So it's it predates Brad. Um, so thanks for that. I'm glad you were able to build those things. Uh, Jacques Lundgren, TV. Ozzy's the best. Yeah, it'll come on. But thanks. Um, uh... <laughs> All right, so that's Ed99924. Unbelievable couple of opening stories. Absolutely hilarious, unreal. Maybe I should let Dave know about my top secret supplier over in England. He's got... Vintage Mullard 34s and XF2s that are already glowing when you pull them out of the box. Now that's quality. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the craziest story that happened to me in amp building was someone not in the episode, someone not putting the tubes into the amp to get it to work. Um, let's see. 
I'm just going to answer stuff that's relevant to what, you know, what I would know. So everybody else that commented, thank you for that too. Um, Jose was pictured behind the stones and pigs around 69 or 70. I got, actually got carbonated pink drink. So that was a little bit of an explosion there. Um, very interesting. You know, the Ampegs, interesting. All right, Gorilla Guitar. All of the discussion of VH1, do you think that Don, not knowing EVH or what his tone was at the time, or even if they could sell 12 albums, invested any time trying to change Ed Sound by slaving, load resisting, et cetera, et cetera? Um, do you think Eddie was a, open to changing his tone and that he was seemingly happy with it at the same time? Isn't it more likely that at recording time, Don, Ted, and I'll just stood back and let Ed dial up whatever tone he was happy with. Um, I could see if his amps were noisy, unfit for recording, and suggestions may have been made, but otherwise not so much. If in the future he complained about his tone and was seeking something he could then, or he could attain, uh, then maybe Don could have offered suggestions, but via which one to me, it just seems out of a character for human interaction. Well, I would agree with a lot of that, um, with the exception of maybe the logistics, okay? And that I think it was a combination of both things. I think we're dealing with, Eddie brings in this kind of dough, so I'm gonna make this kind of cookie, right? It's not, I'm gonna make Eddie use my dough and so I can make my cookie. It's like Eddie brought in the dough, Don Landy was the baker, so to speak. So, um. I don't think that Ed, uh, that Don had anything to do with slaving, load resisting, or any of that. Don, that would be not the case, right? If there was uh, load resisting and slaving, that was done before, right? Um, and was Eddie's deal. Now, I do believe that it's more than likely that Eddie was using his amplifier, right? Now, we don't have a picture of it. We have a picture of the cabinet, possibly in the microphones possibly, but we don't have a picture of the amplifier. And Eddie was known to leave them on the floor anyway. So, um, you know, it, it, whatever it is, it's probably on the floor by his feet. Now I'm willing to say, yes, I'm working off the premise that it is a Marshall and it was his Marshall. I have entertained the idea that it may have been an orange, <laughs> you know, because the way that amp sounded, I was like, well, an orange, with the cathodine phase inverter can sound a little bit splatty and raspy. So who knows, right? So I think that um, they stood back, let Ed dial up the tone that he was happy with. Yes, because the artist has to be happy, right? Um, and then they figured out how to polish it, right? And I think that Don, I don't think he would have said, man, these guys aren't going to sell any albums. So, um, I'm starting to get this latency again that I got during the interview. So I'm going to take off one ear because it feels like there's lag in my voice, which is really messing me up. All right. So um, let me take this off. So I think that, um, where were we? Yeah. All right. So I'm thinking that Don Landy, well, you don't get to be Don Landy by slacking off. And you don't get to be Don Landy by putting your name on things that are just sort of like, eh, you know, they're not going to sell. Who cares? Don's got his name on the album. If I was involved in something and my name was involved in it, I'd be upset if I didn't give it my best, right? So I think it wasn't changing his tone by slaving and all that stuff. It was like, all right, I recorded his amplifier and his sound to the best of my abilities. Now it's my job to create this mix and this, with the, and the recorded sound to make it sound as good as I can. And given Don Landy's prior experiences with things like, you know, oh, Little Feed or especially the Doobie Brothers, I think in all these cases, everybody has a bag of tricks, right? Um, amplifier techs, guitar players, producers, engineers, they have bags of tricks, things that they know work well and they don't have to go very far to get success, right? They've, they've worked out a signal chain or a process or a, a trick or whatever it is to create something that they like. They've done it in the past. They've done it multiple times. It has proven to be successful and they enjoy the way it comes out. 
So my guess is that he applied those same techniques that he applied throughout those years to some extent in those albums. And I think at, at the same time too, that the band, all right, I think between Ted and Don, I think they both realized at the time that Eddie was the star of that band, right? So in a lot of cases, you'll have, you know, the vocal is the most important thing, right? So they'll have, you know, let's say in heavy vocalized sort of like productions, right? Like a Mariah Carey album or something like that or Cher, right? They don't really worry too much about the guitar part being exceptionally interesting to listen to, right? A lot of times it might just be a rock man because it's part of a part of a larger mix that is supporting the star of the show, which is the voice. I think in this case, I, you know, these are my opinions. So please, I mean, don't think I'm like telling you how it is. Um, I think maybe, uh, you know, Ed was the star and I think they were trying to make Eddie's guitar sound great. I mean, they gave him a solo on the album, right? I don't know if you could say it's the case, but I mean, this was like, to me, it was almost like the beginning of like the, I don't know, the guitarist as like the guy sort of deal, right? There's probably others. I mean, you could say obviously Hedrick's page and all those things too, but it was like, I think Don thought of Eddie as being the most important thing. And I think he treated his guitar sound like he treated the Doobie Brothers vocals, you know? So it was a really interesting sound. So that's my theory anyway. So I respect yours for, for sure, a Gorilla, and that, you know, you could easily be correct in all of that. So thank you for that. Um, let's see if there was anything in the side here that was, um, I'm going through this chat to see if there's anything that could be interesting to comment upon. Looking, looking, looking. Oh, Jim Sievel says hi. Hi, Jim. Keep looking. I'm just go, I'm just uh, kind of like skirting down that. Um, all right. So we have a couple of things. Um, blah, 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 blah. So I think it was purposeful purpose had done a few things too and that we had talked about. So maybe Eddie's amp did sound like Rhodes and the console took out the mid-range. Maybe. Uh, maybe the EQ wasn't there. You know, the whole, the signal chain. All right, I think I like the amp. I'm happy with where I'm at with the amp. Now the signal chain is still something that I want to work with, right? Now I will still say that I think slaving is, is the thing. Even with the marshmallow, I think for live performance, you want to slave the marshmallow if you're not using like the ox kind of stuff, right, to the front of the house. You'd want to slave it. And then according to, you know, the most likely theory is that Eddie was always going to where he ended up, right, which was this wet dry rig, right, where there was a master head, effects, power amp, speakers, right, with left and right, you know, all kinds of cool, you know, delays, effects, things like that. That was where he ended up with, was with sophisticated equipment, like, you know, Eventide stuff, Roland stuff, Lexicon stuff, H&H &H power amps. Early on, you could say maybe it's, you know, Echoplexes, EQs, <laughs> and that's about it, right? Maybe you could put the phaser or flanger after the amp. I don't know. We'll have to look into all that. But um, how that blue EQ worked and what it was there for, there's a few ideas. Now, I've built a couple of pedal boards that may shed light on that if you consider that Eddie used two inputs at the same time. So there's a few, there's a few ways that we need to test, right? Amp effects in front, effects in the back. Um, with effects in the front, you could actually go into both channels, one being a more direct sound and one having the effects in it. And then you could have a lessening of the intensity of the effects, like a, a more pleasing um, phase 90 sound because it's 50% there. 
or you know your echoplexes you could turn up a little bit more because it's oh, there's only 50 percent of there and then you may consider that the um the blue eq could be used for one of those signals to create you know um, either a makeup for signal loss or for some reason maybe more mid-range was actually required when you ran the amps in those ways. So, so that these are things that we need to explore still. I mean, that, this ain't over when it comes to stuff like that. You know, this still has to continue. So there's going to be a lot of experimenting left to do. So I love that question, um, purposeful. So thanks for that. Um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, there's like Bent Tom here is saying um, that you can, you know, do you could get the sound a lot of different ways. And this is true. I will absolutely say that there's permutations for everything and not one solution is necessarily the only way to get there. Right. So I like to entertain everything because if I didn't do that, it would kind of be like I'd still be stuck in third grade, you know, with watercolors. I mean, maybe I am. I don't know. But you gotta you gotta entertain that you're wrong, and you gotta entertain that you that you don't know everything. And you have to entertain not all, I mean entertain it. You have to know it, <laughs> right? So hey, I I just thought an idea. I might be wrong about stuff. <laughs> like no, you can be certain you're wrong about everything <laughs> because you're you know if you haven't thought that through life, you haven't examined yourself or maybe enough. I don't know. I shouldn't say that either because I'm wrong about that. That's kind of Zen. Um, yeah, so there's, I think, um, well, who, what was it? Ah, there was something about um, explaining the dry, ver the direct sound, right? It's, it's, is it here still? Is it, is it still here or is it gone? Oh, Simon. Okay, yeah, Simon. Simon was asking to talk about like the direct theory, the direct sound theory. So yeah, I still, I'm still like liking that. For me, it's working, right? We just talked about that earlier that, on the pedal, I'm using some direct and I'm using some greenback. And for me, that seems to be okay. And I'm not saying that you have to do it that way. You know, maybe you could simulate the direct with pumping up, you know, on the, um, you know, on a, on a, on a uh, three band API EQ. I mean, the top band is going way up, right? Like, when, let me, I don't have it memorized. So we're up around, whew. 20 kilohertz, right, is where you can go. So, you know, you can put a lot of top end into a uh, signal with an API EQ. They're pretty powerful. You could do a lot with them. So I wouldn't discount the, the use of things like APIs and then, you know, parallel compression, um, the Poltec, right? The Poltec goes even higher. I mean, you look at a Poltec, you could get up there, well, not, not not higher, 16 kilohertz, but it has, you know, a lot of ability to create a lot of good top end. So, you know, speakers, mic placements, all that kind of stuff is great. So for me, it was like I wanted to eliminate as many of those, some of those things as possible so I could at least make forward progress. So to me, it was like eliminate miking technique, number one, because you just move a tiny, move a mic, a tiny, you breathe on a microphone and it sounds differently. And then you'll never be able to compare your results over a long period of time where you're making amplifier changes and doing all things like that. You can't do it because it's like, did I make the amp brighter or is the mic moved? I don't know, right? So the aux was like the thing that made all of this possible was to eliminate miking technique to where it's consistent and now we can work on everything else around the, the system and be able to tell whether our results are real or not. All right, so I think that's good for, for today. It probably went on for forever. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll try to keep things an hour or less so that, you know, you have a chance to eat your sandwich and, you know, hang out and all that good stuff. So it's good to be back. It was great to be on Dave's show. Lots of fun, you know, in the future. Lots of things to do. Um, we'll see where it all goes. I, I'm hopeful that there'll be some fun stuff out there. So uh, uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.